Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. One more time for the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord, Bridgeway. I welcome you in the name of the Lord to Bridgeway Community Church. I'm the founding and senior pastor, Dr. David Anderson. For those of you at, <clears throat> at our Owens Mills campus, thank you so much uh, for being there today, Owens Mills, Reisterstown. And for those of you around the world, wherever you are, so good that you are here. You have found your way into a four-week series, and this is the third installment of Table Talk, Conversations About Home. Our first message was about spiritual authority, and then last week we talked about fellowship, where you saw my amazing drawing abilities on the board. I'm sure you remember that. And then today we're going to talk about the breaking of bread. And then next week we're going to talk about prayer, and we're actually going to pray next week as well. So please come back ready for that. Now, these four things are found in Acts chapter 2, verse 42, the first century church, which says all these new believers who were a part of a new family, a new community of Christians, they committed themselves or devoted themselves to these four things, the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to breaking of bread, and to prayer. So we're taking each one of these each week. I also want to say to you, next week, come back, not only for the topic of prayer, but we're going to have a homecoming service. All right, so since our theme is coming home, we're going to have a homecoming service. And a lot of people, when they think of homecoming, they think of football. Well, guess what? We're going to be showing football as well, because I understand the Ravens and the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be having a, having a game. And so since you're already home, just stay back and watch it. Wear your favorite jersey. All right, of your favorite team, who, whatever the sport is next week, and, uh, you know, tailgate with us, all right? So I think the game starts at 1, so go get some food and uh, bring your grills and make some hot dogs because I'm going to come and eat some of your food, okay? So just come chill out, hang out with me. I'm going to try to hit both campuses, and I love a good hot dog, so there you go. Now, before I pray, I do want to highlight two other things. I want to remind you of these two trips that are coming up that you are welcome to join me on. The first one is Nigeria. That is a presidential delegation of those who will go with me there to the door of return experience. And the reason why I want to tell you this now is because we really only have a few weeks left and I have a few spots left. So if you have the money, you have the time off, uh, October 17th through 25th, let me know today. Come see me in the lobby. Or if you're not here, email me at info at andersonspeaks.com. That's info at andersonspeaks.com. Calm. The other trip is in the spring, but we still need you to sign up now. It's already halfway full, and we're already buying tickets. And so we're going to Israel. So you can either go to Africa and Nigeria, and specifically the, the home of all uh, humans that came out of the continent of Africa, where the Garden of Eden was, or your spiritual home, Israel. And again, you can go on andersonspeaks.com and just hit a link uh, to get connected there. The last thing I'll say uh, before I pray, uh, and that is uh, a couple of weeks ago I said in my message, if you're at Owens Mills and you want to ask me a question, email me a question and maybe I'll put one or two up on the screen. So there is one that I did pick and I want you to hear what the question was. I'm going to answer it and then I'm going to pray and get into our topic. Dr. Anderson, how do you feel about unequally yoked relationships? And how can you share the word to significant others effectively or set boundaries to them about your religion? My answer, being unequally yoked in, in a dating relationship will cause the believing person to be pulled away from the faith and your spiritual walk with Christ. I have seldom seen it the other way. I would recommend creating romantic boundaries with the unbelieving partner. The most effective boundary is not to allow yourself to get romantically involved in the first place. Now, if you're already married and one of you gets saved, that's a different answer, a different story. Now, if you're already in it, a dating relationship with a non-believer, then surely don't get sexual, or you will basically give up your entire testimony of Christ. Repentance is possibly what is needed in order for you to come back to Christ, or maybe just redirection. You can ask God to help you get your relationship with the significant other in proper alignment with him. That is my answer, and I'm sticking with it. Let's bow together in a word of prayer. 
Lord, as we go into this word about the breaking of bread, I just pray, God, that you would be with us and teach us. And thank you so much for being our daily bread. In Jesus' name we pray. Together everyone said, amen and amen. It says in Acts chapter 2 that they actually came together and they ate together regularly, that family feeling in their homes. It says in chapter 2, verse 46, this, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread together with glad and sincere hearts. What is it about eating together that has such a nice feeling to it? When you're growing up and you smell the food that maybe your mother or your father is cooking and there's just something when you walk into the house and you smell something that's been in a crock pot or something that's been cooked or I love the way it smells when they're frying up some onions or something and you just kind of walk in or some bacon and you just kind of walk in. You're like, yes, this feels like home. But whatever it is, it seems like there's all kind of love put into that food. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? And when I was growing up, they used to talk about, man, when you're eating it, man, she put her foot in it. I'm like, ugh. (laughs) You're like, who came up with that? But this whole idea of making food with love. Well, when we break bread together with other people, it provides us opportunities to have social connection. That's one of the things you get. You get a social connection when you break bread and have a meal with people. Secondly, you can have relational peace. You know, it's hard to fight and eat at the same time. And so in a lot of cultures, you know, eating together is a way of being hospitable, but it also is a way to demonstrate peace. And so there's social connection where there's common conversation and getting to know one another informally. And there are also conversations that just arise that otherwise wouldn't if you weren't in a relaxed environment. And also relational peace. And nothing's worse than sitting at the table having to eat when you don't have relational peace. Maybe some of you have felt that before where there's conflict in the house and the family's sitting there and they're eating, but no one's talking. There's nothing more painful than that. But I tell you what, there's nothing more joyous and warm that when you're cutting the food and eating the food and you're laughing, like me and my wife and my daughter last night, uh, primarily probably at me, but anyway, it doesn't matter. Just the fact that you're laughing together and enjoying one another, there's something that cannot replace that kind of relational peace. And thirdly, I would say one of the benefits of eating together is spiritual fellowship. And this is what we talked about last week. When believers come together and they break bread together, then what's happening is they're they're representing the body of Christ. It's like communion for all. It's like when it says that they were committed to breaking bread together, this fellowship meant that there was a family feeling and there was a sharing of relationship in Christ together at the top of the triangle. And Jesus introduces this memory aid called communion where you would remember his death, burial, and resurrection around a meal. Now, when you think about this, like Jesus could have instituted any kind of memory aid to say, I want you to remember my death, burial, and resurrection. And he decided to do it over a meal. Question, could it be that Jesus wanted us to remember him, his death, burial, and resurrection, every single time we break bread together as believers? Could he be instituting something that he knew every single human being would be doing? And when believers came together, that they would actually proclaim his death, burial, and resurrection. That every time we break bread together, we are in communion. That every time we break bread together, we are reminded of what Jesus did for us. In fact, here's a practical application right now. Break bread in fellowship with a believer or believers at least one time this week. Would you take that on as a practical application that I'm going to break bread with a fellow believer at least one time this week before I come back to church next week? If you're not careful, you can actually not be cognizant of it. And so you may say, well, I've broken bread with a a believer. But what I'm asking you to do is when you break bread with that believer, proclaim what Christ has done for you on the cross before you take your first bite. You know, say, thank you, Jesus. 
three times. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you did for us. And then go ahead and eat. That kicks it up a notch. But you know, that's just one practical application. But bread is a metaphor for so much more, not just eating, but it does have to do with the daily dependence on God. In fact, in the Lord's Prayer, Jesus says, when you pray, we ask God the Father to give us this day, what? Our daily bread in Matthew 6, 11. This is our daily provision. And what is it that you must depend on God for daily? What is it that you must depend on God for daily? Jesus says, ask God, our Heavenly Father, for him to provide what we need. This could be as basic as food, or it could be something else that we need for him to sustain us in our lives. It's worth asking the question. Or it could mean any other daily provision that you would not enjoy apart from the grace of God. In fact, let me ask again in a different way. What is it that you need from God today that you cannot provide for yourself? I ask you that at Owens Mills, Reisterstown. I ask you that wherever you are in the world. What is it that you need from God today that you cannot provide for yourself? If you'll allow me just 30 seconds to ask you to think about it and to share it with someone around you, maybe someone sitting on the couch near you, maybe someone sitting in front of you or behind you, whether you're at Owens Mills or whether you're in this house, and if you're not comfortable, you can just put your head down and act like you're in prayer and no one will know that you're being antisocial. You're just really extra spiritual, okay? But this is what I want you to do. Answer this question in just the next 30 seconds. What is it that you need from God today that you cannot provide for yourself? Go for it. Online, go for it. Write it, chat it. Ready, set, go. Share it with someone next to you or bow deep in prayer. Owens Mills, what is it that you need today that only God can provide? Thank you for typing it in the chat. Go ahead. In 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, Three, two, and one. You know, when you think about it, if that is your daily bread, and you're like, today this is what I need, that's your daily bread. I mean, I need oxygen and air daily. Can we start there? I need to be in my right mind daily. Can we start there? I need the usability of my limbs daily. I need the blood running warm through my veins Daily. I need peace in my mind. Daily. I need wisdom and discernment. Daily. Jesus said, give us this day, this day, our daily bread. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow is not even promised to you. Don't worry about tomorrow because tomorrow has enough problems of its own. Or like someone said, don't worry about tomorrow. God is already there. This day, this day you're dating, tomorrow you're broken up. This day you're healthy, tomorrow you're sick with COVID. This day you're single, tomorrow you meet Mr. or Mrs. Wright. Jesus says, pray to the Father, give us this day our daily bread. And do you notice Jesus' assumption here? You want to know what Jesus' assumption is here? Here's his assumption. His assumption is that you are actually going to pray every day. He puts it in the text. How do we pray, Lord? And one of the things he says is, when you pray to the Father, say, give us this day. That means he's actually assuming 
that every believer is going to pray every day. Give us this day our daily bread, which leads us to the second practical application. Are you ready? Pray every day. You say, well, when? Well, let me tell you, pray in the morning. As soon as you wake up, no cell phone before you talk to God first. Because if you open up your cell phone, it could take you down a completely different road and change the attitude of your heart before you even get started. Some of you will pick up your cell phone and open it before you even put your feet on the floor. I was with a group of acquaintances last week having a Bible study, and we all decided that we would wake up the next day, Monday morning, and the first thing we were going to do before looking at our phones is we all agreed to pray. 25 people. What was it like that next morning when 25 people who were together the night before says, we're going to start our day off with prayer. I hope heaven smiled. I got a lot of texts early that morning. I did it. I prayed. I talked to the Lord. Now I'm texting you. God was first. So pray in the morning. Here's the next time. Pray before you eat your meals. Three meals a day. Pray before you eat your meals. Jesus looked up and he gave thanks before he ate on the road to Emmaus. This was his pattern. In Luke chapter 24, verse 30, it says this. When he, speaking of Jesus, was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. Jesus prayed before he ate. Paul prayed before he ate as well. In Acts chapter 27, verse 35, it says, after that, he, speaking of Paul, said this. He took some bread and gave thanks to God in front of them all. Then he broke it and began to eat. So if you don't pray before you eat, now start. Start now. For some of you, I know what you're thinking. This is so very basic. No, basic is good because we can get away from basic, can't we? But I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry, I'm so hungry. I know. But God is about to satisfy that need. The least you can do is thank him. And then when you pray, you pray at night. Pray at night before you go to bed. You see, this is five times of prayer already in a day. Morning, before three meals, and night, that's five times a day, and you don't even have to be a Muslim to pray five times a day. Look at that. You know, some people are like, man, I'm the Muslims pray five times a day. I can't pray five times. Yeah, you can right there. In the morning, at night, and three times during the day when you eat. Five times at least. Our daily bread is our provision from God. And recognizing him as our Jehovah Jireh, the Lord who provides, keeps us in a place as humble humans. But when we run around making things happen ourselves, we're underscoring our belief in our hearts that we're God and he's not. We only come to him if we need him because we got this, Lord. But when we bow before him and ask him for our daily bread and give thanks for our daily bread, we are demonstrating humility and dependence on God. You know, one of the biblical examples of dependence on God for food specifically is in the Old Testament when God would provide the daily needs of the children of Israel who are out in the desert. And in Exodus 16, it says that manna would fall from heaven, manna being bread. It would fall from the sky like dew, sitting on the ground for them to eat. It says in chapter 16, verse 4, Then the Lord said to Moses, I will rain down bread from heaven for you. The people are to go out each day and gather enough food for what? That day. This demonstrated daily dependence on God. And God was testing their ability to trust him and to provide for their daily needs. They didn't have refrigerators back then where they could hold on to food for days, if not weeks. And for some of us, the food has been sitting in there much longer. We need to clean it out. They didn't have grocery stores that were stockpiled with food that they could walk to or drive to anytime they wanted. There was no Publix or Giant or Safeway or Whole Foods that makes you pay a whole lot of money. They didn't have <laughs> any of that. They didn't have a Wegmans, a place you could go shop and eat at the same time. I mean, what a concept that is. Go, eat, and then shop. 
Amazing. They didn't have that. And then once they got out of the desert, they still had to depend on farmers who would have to plant seeds, and then they would have to depend on seasonal provisions from God based on the crops that were produced. They had to trust God for daily rain and sunshine in order to have their sustenance. But a Bible example from the Old Testament is just one example of dependence. You know, there's another example of of dependence. There's another example of the things that we need besides food. It's a secular example, and that's the example of money. In our culture, beyond food, bread is often a metaphor for what? For money. We call it moolah, cheddar, bacon, (laughs) dough. In fact, if a couple is married, the one who brings in the most money to the household is often known as the what? The breadwinner. Whether bread or money, the the idea is daily provision. You know, R.C. Sproul is a deceased Bible teacher who wrote a touching story regarding the Korean War. And this is what he wrote. I quote, after the Korean War ended, South Korea was left with a large number of children who had been orphaned by the war. Relief agencies came in to deal with all the problems that arose in connection with having so many orphaned children. One relief worker told R.C. Sproul about a problem they encountered with the children who were in the orphanages. Even though the children had three meals a day provided for them, they were restless and anxious at night and had difficulty sleeping. As they talked to the children, they soon discovered that the children had great anxiety about whether they would have food the next day. To help resolve this problem, the relief workers in one particular orphanage decided that each night when the children were put to bed, the nurses would give them, would place a single piece of bread in each child's hand. The bread wasn't intended to be eaten. It was simply intended to be held by the children as they went to sleep. It was a security blanket for them reminding them that there would be provision for their daily needs. Sure enough, the bread calmed the children's anxieties and helped them sleep. Likewise, we take comfort in knowing that our physical needs are met, that we have food or bread for our needs. You know, in a spiritual sense, God's word is the bread of life. God's word is our security blanket. Jesus is the bread of life. Jesus says, I'm the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He said that in John 6, 35. In verse 47 of that same chapter, John 6, he says, I tell you the truth, whoever believes has everlasting life. And in verse 48, he says it again, I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, as we talked about, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. He says it again, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Jesus is our daily bread. And when the worries of life occupy your mind like those orphan children, You must hold on to the word of God in your hands. And like those orphan kids held on to that single piece of bread, you and I have to hold on to Jesus. We have to hold on to God's word. Or like the old folks used to sing in my little church growing up, hold to God's unchanging hands. Y'all remember that? Probably a couple of you. It's so old, I don't know who would know it, but... It says something like this, hold to his hands, God's unchanging hands. Hold to his hands, God's unchanging hands. Build, build your hope on things eternal. You've got.
got the change in hand. You know, one of the things that we need to remember is that every single day presents different problems that we're just not looking for or expecting. Friday was one of those days in my household. I talked to my wife, Amber, who called, and she said, you know, I took Luke to the airport, and Luke was driving, and we were going to DCA, the Reagan National Airport. And as we were approaching the RFK Stadium, we're driving. We hear this screeching, screeching sound of a vehicle. So Luke slows down, and then within two seconds, this truck comes and slams into the car in front of us, knocking it across the other lane, over the median, onto oncoming traffic. And she says that truck that hit that car then bounced off the car and ran right into a huge oak tree, dead on impact. She says, I'm still shaking. Luke and her, as they're driving, said, should we pull over? But there was no room to pull over. But some other car came next to him and rolled down the window and said, you know they died on impact. And then he drove away. And you're like, what's going on here? And so now Luke is on the plane and Amber's driving back and she calls me and tells me this. And I said, baby, Psalm 9111, I thank God that you are okay. She said if it was just two seconds more, if Luke did not slow down, that would have been us that got hit. I said, baby, Psalm 9111, I'll send it on text to you and Luke, which says, for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all of your ways. God's provision and God's protection was their daily bread on Friday. Let me give you these three applications I gave you two. The first one, break bread and fellowship with a fellow believer this week and remember what Christ has done for you. Number two, pray every day, at least five times a day. And here's the third one, hold on to your daily bread. I mean, Jesus in his word is your daily bread. There's actually a small book called Our Daily Bread. Anybody ever see that? It's a small little book that my family used to do our devotionals in. When we were kids, every single day, before we ate dinner in the evening or after dinner, we'd have to gather in the living room, my mom, my dad, my two sisters, and me, three of us. My brother was already out the house. And it's just one little page which gives you uh, a Bible verse, a, a little small written article, uh, a question of the day, and a prayer. And we had to do this. And I didn't enjoy it much, honestly, when I was a kid. Because then mom would make us stand up and hold hands. And each of us would say a prayer, a short little prayer. And, and then we had to kiss the person to our right's cheek. Can you imagine having to kiss your sister's cheek when you're eight years old? You just don't like it very much. You know, I love my sister so much, I can't wait to kiss him on the cheek now. And you know what? Having devotionals and meals together is something that is just not normal. Remember what I said about basic? Maybe we ought to just get back to basics, friends. Come home. Bring that family feeling. And as a gift for you today to help you, if you want the daily bread, we have them for you when you walk out. Whether you're in Owens Mills or whether you're in Columbia, Maryland, grab one for your family. It's a little devotional every day for like three months, and then you can always get more if you want. But we ordered a 1,000 of them. So go ahead and take them with you if you think that's going to help you hold on to your daily bread. You're very welcome. Thanks for saying that. Um, That's, that's not all that happened on Friday, though, JP. <laughs> so Amber's on the phone, and I said, baby, something's going on with my lip. Um, I think I bit it, or I think I got bit. And I'm about to show you a couple of pictures, and I don't mean to startle you, and they're a little bit embarrassing. So we'll start light. Let me put the first picture up. This is around 11 a.m. on Friday, and you might notice on the right side of my lip, this is just a little bit bigger than the rest. And this has happened before, but the problem is I keep licking it, you know, and I'm sure I was aggravating it, right? 
So that's 11 o'clock. Now it's 3 o'clock time for the radio show. So check this out. It got a little bigger, right? Okay, after the radio show, I know, right? After the radio show, look at this one. Okay, now this one, I know, I know. I'm serious, y'all. I was dying. You know I'm vain. I said, I ain't preaching on Sunday. The devil is a liar. I'm going to call Pastor Jared. He just became a doctor. And if he can't do it, I'm going to David Heidegger. Somebody going to preach, man. Okay, y'all. Okay, are you ready? That was 4 o'clock. Now, Amber calls me. I'm sitting in my chair at home. No one's at home. She's on her way back. After she tells me about her story, I say, oh, yeah, something's wrong with my lip. And she says, send me a picture. And here's the picture. This is 6 p.m. on Friday. Oh. Dang. <laughs> I know. Y'all, you have no idea. If this would have happened to you, I know you can laugh. I told Amber, don't laugh at me. And at first she had so much empathy. And then after a while, I guess it was humorous. I was like, you need to come home and kiss me right now. The kiss you never had before, girl. She said, David, seriously, you need to go to urgent care. So I Googled it. I went to an urgent care about 10 minutes away from where I live. And here's the urgent care picture. You can see now, I know, whoa, dang. That's, that's like crazy, right? And the next day I'm supposed to like go do some speaking and, and hang out with some people. And I'm like, look, when I went to urgent care, I wore a mask because like, I didn't want nobody to see me. I'm serious. Y'all may not like masks. I'm gonna tell you, on Friday, I love myself a mask. I was like, where my mask? Where my mask? I can't find no mask. Where the mask? I thought COVID was over. I need a mask. I'm not leaving without a mask. So I got a mask. I went over. I went over, you know. And, and then now I, I go to urgent care. And let me just tell you now, I don't know. Anybody been to urgent care before? Okay, so I go to urgent care. I check in and everything. And they want you to do everything on your phone. And they send you all these texts and stuff. And now it's time for them to see me. And I have my, I have my mask on. So then I go in. And she goes, hey, how you doing? What, what's the problem? I said, I think I got an allergic reaction or something. She goes, what, where is it? I went like this. She went, oh. <laughs> you know that's bad. She said, oh. When you scare the nurse practitioner, that's a problem. Now, the girl had already, the girl before her had already taken my blood pressure. I pulled up my sleeve, took my blood pressure and all that. But now she sends in a nurse practitioner. And I think she may have told her because she came in kind of looking at everything. All right, can I see it? So anyway, I show it to her. She like, oh. She goes, I, I, I'll be right back. And so I'm still sitting there kind of embarrassed. And, and then she, she sends the other girl back in, and she has this long syringe. And I was like, what's that? <laughs> All right, oh, you want the bottom lip to fill it. So it matches as a filler? Is that what it is? Because these botched fillers, man, they, they jacked up. She said, no, 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 we need to give you this shot. It's a steroid. It'll help the inflammation go down. I said, oh, okay. So I'm pulling up my sleeve. She goes, oh, no, sir, it has to go in your, your behind. I'm like, what? This is a lip problem. Said, no, no, it, 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 it has to, it, it has to, it. okay. But I'm thinking to myself, listen, I, 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 you know when people say, you know, I always want to have on good underwear because you never know if you get in a car accident? I used to think those people were crazy. Now, I'm going to pray for my daily bread and my daily draw. Because you never know. And so I'm like, sir, we just need to find a, a, just a fatty part. I'm like, well, you're not going to have a problem with that. There you go. That ain't going to be a problem. So I'm like, you know, yo, hurry up, you know. And she goes, you're going to feel a little sting. I was like, okay. I'm preparing myself. She goes, but don't flinch and don't muscle up. Like, what's going on here, right? And so she, she, puts, she puts it in the fatty part, and I'm like, ow. And she goes, just a little bit more. <laughs> now I feel like a little wimp. Just hurry up, hurry up. She takes it out. She puts a Band-Aid on it. I say, are we done? She goes, yeah, but now I got to massage it. <laughs> I kid you not, friends. I had to go home and confess to Amber. <laughs> so when she's all done, I'm like, well, I'm about equality. What about the others? No, I didn't. I didn't. I was like, 
I just walked out with the limp, you know. But no, seriously, now, after all of that's over and they give me these meds and, and everything, I go home and I'm like, what just happened to me? I went in because my lip looked crazy, and now I'm showing my ass, but I wasn't expecting nobody, and I'm taking shots. What's the point? No one knows what a day holds. No one. I get home. I sit in my chair. My wife comes home. And after some pleasant trees, I'm sitting in my chair. I fell asleep, and she snapped a picture of me without me knowing. Check out this one. <laughs> Unbelievable. But then the next morning on Saturday, it got better. So I'm thinking, maybe I'll be able to preach. And so here's a side-by-side -side picture from Saturday. So you see it's getting better, right? So the shot, the shot helped, evidently. And then by Saturday, about 5 o'clock, here I am. So I'm like, thank you. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. But I tell you, I wanted no fellowship with nobody for 24 hours. And you know, the one thing that the nurse practitioner did say, she goes, people pay for lips like this. <laughs> so someone sent me this picture. Look at this, look at this botched lip filler. I'm like, well, hey, is that what I look like? And people pay for that? All I could think about was that movie Hitch when he ate some shellfish <laughs> and it like, uh, like he had an allergic reaction. Check this out. Anybody remember this? <laughs> so listen, the message is, at, is really at the end, but I'll tell you this, you never know what a day holds. Praying for your daily bread is more than just food and money. It's protection on the road like my wife and my son. It's allergic reactions and how you get that taken care of and in remission. You never know what the day holds. But you can always know who holds the day.